Good evening and welcome to the Ojai City Council and Redevelopment Agency Successor Agency regular meeting of January 28th. Um, for anyone wishing to speak on an agendized item, if you would fill out a card and make sure we have that. Um, limit your comments to three minutes. And we expect direct your comments to the council. And we expect the audience to maintain order and decorum. Roll call. Councilmember Blatz. Here. Councilmember Clapp. Present. Councilmember Laura. Here. Mayor Pro Temp Smith is absent this evening. Mayor Strobel. Present. Pledge of Allegiance, and if Councilwoman Clapp would lead us. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Follow me. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a presentation this evening, Safe Harbor Kids, and we have um, two people here to present that, and oh, I thought I'd lost the cards. Petria Alexandra Williams and John Williams. Hello, thank you for having us here. Uh, my name is Petri Alexandra Williams, and it's Safety Harbor Kids, and we have been serving local orphans, foster, and homeless children for over seven years. We provide career, college, music, and art programs to children within foster care homes within 15 different foster care homes from Santa Barbara to Pasadena. And we also work intimately with the Casita Springs girls right down the street. Um, the children that we serve, when they hit 18, 80% will end up homeless and 60% will end up in prison. And I, as leaders of our community, it is our responsibility to help these children and to change those statistics. And at Safety Harbor Kids, we're doing that. We bring community members together with the children around the holidays. We show the children, we give them jobs, we show them about different jobs. We have motivational speakers at these events. We have career guidance. We have, they fill out applications on how to get a job. They learn about how to get into college. And they have music and art lessons while having a party. If it's, whether it's our etiquette and manners where we teach the kids the basic skills that they need to get a job, to get adopted, and to succeed in life. That's to fill the gap where they don't have. Um, at the holiday party, the gifts that we give the kids, it's the only gift a lot of these kids will get all year long. And that's quotes directly come from the homes that we serve. Uh, we make sure they all leave with shoes, school supplies, and the necessities that they need to make it in life, along with mentors and help and guidance. Uh, what we're doing with, uh, let's see, uh, just sorry about this. So what we're doing with this, we're also providing, we're, well, right now we're raising funds to do our programs in the home. That's where we bring tutors to the homes to do the music lessons, the art lessons, and the academic tutoring. And we've been offered scholarships from Pepperdine University. Our children will have full scholarships with guidance and financial funding. We have girls in, in Casita Springs right here that we know or could get there and they could do it. We could make a difference in their lives and break the cycle of homelessness, poverty, and prison that ensnares our lo local foster youth. Um, of the kids, only 10% foster kids ever get to go to college. We have the kids, when they come, and of those children, only 2% ever graduate. When they come to our events, we have them fill out forms. And we tell them, find out who they are, what they want to be when they grow up. Do they want to go to college? Do they want to have mentors? And we watch the transition as they come in with no, nothing, nobody, scratch out with negative, you know, and as they start to grow and they start to learn, it changes. And we see the transition in their forms from these kids as they go from event to event. What we're doing uh, with one of our young ladies, 
I was taking a walk a couple weeks ago in Libby Park, and I ran into a counselor, Heather, from the Cedar Springs home. She told me in the seven years that she's been working there, our young girl, Marissa Miller, is the first young lady she's ever seen successfully roll out of the system in the fact that she has a job, she's fit renting a room, she's got a full-time job, she's going, I'm sorry, a part-time job, she's going to school to finish her high school, she's getting doing part-time to get her certified nurses uh, administration assistant license, and she is enrolled to go to college. And so we're helping her with the things because things come along the ways and they stop you and you can't succeed and they don't have somebody to turn to. So that's what some of the things we do at Safety Harbor Kids. Um, we are currently, our fundraising, um, we'd like to do an event next year at uh, Jackson Brown is on our board and he's going to be doing a concert for us so we'd like to do something at Libby Bowl in 2015, or 14, 15 I guess, sorry, <laughs> um, and then we're also going to be doing a marathon and we invite community members to come work with Safety Harbor Kids to participate. You get a real chance to hands on, to see the child to see it make a difference and to watch them. They walk in closed and sheltered and after just a few hours with the people, they open up and they, they come in and go, I can do that, whatever it is. So we give them the, the inspiration, dreams and hopes so that they have a reason to go to school, a reason not to get in trouble, to need a reason and a purpose for staying on the right track. And that's basically what we've been doing. Uh, one young man who had been with us uh, for quite a few years, he said that Safety Harbor Kids helped him overcome his fears. And um, I would like to introduce you to um, uh, also uh, some of our local community members that have participated and helped, Larry Wild from Coldwell Banker, um, the Ojai Business Center is one of our sponsors, Rainbow Bridge, and we, would like to invite the community, the council, to let you know we're here. We've been kind of a quiet little secret doing our services and not letting anybody know. My husband and I uh, relocated here two years ago, and we're just so blessed to have moved from Topanga and Malibu here to Ojai. And we are expanding our services here within the community, and would like to let everybody know we're here. I'd like to introduce you to John Williams. He is the founder of Safety Harbor Kids, and he was a parentless child who grew up in Malibu, had this vision, and pulled me out of producing films into saving children's lives. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Very nice, very nice, thank you. And I was just curious how much time I have here. It's gonna three minutes? Three to five minutes. Beautiful. Uh, Safety Arbor Kids is, uh, as Petri mentioned, uh, is a wonderful charity uh, geared toward helping children in college career music and the arts programs. Uh, you know, there are a lot of charities out there, a lot of philanthropic organizations. Uh, one of the things that sets Safety Harbor Kids apart is uh, our expense ratio. Charity operates on a 25% expense ratio, uh, which is very low. Many charities are up there in the 80 and 90 percentile, which means when you donate $100 to the charity, 90% of your money goes to expenses, and only $10 of that $100 actually goes to help the programs. So it's something that uh, people really have to look out for when they're donating to charity, and we keep our expense ratio very low. I'm a volunteer. Don't take any money for helping the organization. Petri takes I think she made $2,500 in 2011 just to reimburse her for, you know, paper clips and, and post-it notes, I think, a very low amount of money. So they're not in here uh, to make money. What Safe Harbor Kids is here to do is to help children. And they help children within 50 miles of here. And they have a wonderful program where it's one-on-one. -on -one. You can actually go to the organization. You can go to the event, see the kids, see how your donation puts smiles on the kids' faces. I think it's a wonderful way to donate, a wonderful way to take part you know, in, in the community and helping kids. Uh, safetyharborkids.org, that's S-A-F-E-T-Y-H-A-R-B-O-R-K-I-D-S dot O-R-G. There's some, uh, I think she has some flyers up, up here as well, if anyone would like to uh, take one of those. Uh, again, I just think it's a wonderful organization. Uh, the first time uh, I was there, I met a man who had, was a 20-year director 
and these people are pretty hard skinned. I mean, they've seen a lot of hard stuff in their lives with these poor kids. And uh, he sat down next to me and, uh, you know, was very gruff and said, I, I had to come here and see, you know, what you guys are doing to my kids. And, and I, you know, said, you know, what do you mean? What, what are we doing to your kids? And he said, in the 20 years of being a director at foster homes, I've never seen such a profound and lasting effect on my children as I have after just one event with, with Safety Harbor Kids. And I was just, you know, validated my whole found, founding of the charity in that one statement. I was just so pleased to hear that. And I spoke with him for a little while, and then I said, well, you know, what is it? You came here to see what is so special about Safety Harbor Kids. Tell us what it is. And he looked around, and he said, it's the people. And he said, it's the, the kind people that come here. We don't hire people. It's not some uh, guy flipping burgers, making, you know, okay, here you go, kid. Here you go, kid. I got to get to my next gig. It's not like that. It's a nice volunteer in the community, people much like yourselves. Did you get it, you know, uh, lettuce on that burger? Did you get some tomato? Would you like a second one? You know, that type of care and consideration for the children. It's a whole different world, and the children really pick up on it. And, you know, these poor kids, as Petri mentioned, I was with one, one kid, another quick short story on the beach, and I spent a little time with him. Counselor came up to me and said, you know, how do you, you know that boy? And I said, yeah, he's Ari, and, and uh, great kid, great kid, great personality, wonderful child. He said, you know, he never gets any contact with any parents, no relatives, uh, nothing for Christmas, nothing for his birthday, nothing. Never, you know, all he gets is the group home. And these aren't, these aren't foster family homes that we're serving. These are group homes. They're people who are uh, hired to take care of the kids, you know, on a nine to five basis. When that's over, you know, their relationship with the child is over. And, uh, you know, it's not a, they're, they're nice places, but they're not happy homes, you know, as, as I think many of us are used to. Uh, so they really need this interaction. They really need role models. So again, I just encourage uh, the community, the council, if you know of any civic groups that might be interested in, in hearing about Safety Harbor Kids or donating to Safety Harbor Kids, wonderful organization, very low expense ratio. The money goes to help the kids. And uh, you know, we really designed the best, most efficient charity that we could come up with. And I think we did a great job. And I'd love uh, for you to take a look at it. Thank you very much for having us present. Thank, Thank you. you. Do you have any questions I can answer? Mr. Williams, um, you mentioned the age of 18. Mm -hmm. So do the, the, the services that you offer to the children, is that through the age of 18? Or do you have any uh, people you work with older than that? Great question. The, the foster homes essentially have the children uh, from you know, 7 to 17. And then once they turn 18, they what they call age out of the program. And basically, there's, you're out on the streets, kid. You have limited education. You have no contacts, little, little or no resources, and most likely no way to get a job. You have no address, so you can't get financial aid. You can't enroll in college. Uh, you're in trouble at age 18. Congratulations. There you go. You're free. Uh, po homelessness, <coughs> poverty, and prison are the next steps for the child, for 98% of them. So uh, it's a great question. And what our goal is, is to catch them be as they hit the streets. Uh, we're raising funds not only to do the uh, education programs that Petri mentioned, the tutoring programs, where we take tutors to the homes, but we also want to buy uh, a couple of buildings and have them as dorms. And so the kids can actually check in combined with an arts and education center where they can live in a, uh, an apartment building style, supervised, uh, you know, under, under uh, control. And then in the daytime, they're going and learning the college career music and the arts at, as 18-year-olds. So right now, they just changed the law of where they, uh, you, the kids can apply for an extended stay. They can get stay in the homes or the foster care system through 21. Uh, not all of them get to do that. And there's still a tremendous need for these kids to have a place to go when they hit the streets, 
keep them out of jail. We uh, keep them, you know, from being homeless and being victimized on the streets, and then teach them how to be successful members of society, learn how to fill out job applications, how to get jobs. It's another thing we do is we network with the small businesses. As she mentioned, like uh, Ohio Business Center is one of our uh, supporters here. Well, what we would do is eventually establish a relationship with them and say, you know what, I noticed that you might be hiring some counter help pretty soon. We'd like to introduce Ari to you. And he, you know, they'd interview. And so we also have, uh, you know, career programs for, to actually transition the children right out. That's a great question, and, uh, and there's a tremendous need for that. Uh, we like to uh, have, a, have an effect on them as youngsters and then catch them in a safety net when they turn 18. That's the ultimate goal. I have a question. Any other questions? How many kids are you talking on there, average? Yeah, that's a great question. A couple thousand, uh, 2,000 in the foster home system right here in L.A. And those are the lucky kids that are actually in group homes. Uh, which I think that number is actually workable. It's a close, you know, that, that's a number that can be dealt with. It's not 50,000 or 100,000. These are, you know, kids we can, uh, we can focus on and improve their lives on an individual basis. Uh, then there's a very large number of homeless kids. The homeless kids, you know, they, they have usually one family member, but they're, uh, they're in the tens of thousands. But what we mainly focus on is the foster children in group homes. The reason we do that is I, was a, uh, I wasn't a foster kid when I was young, but I uh, never had a father, and my mom died when I was nine years old, and I lived with a family in a, in a home. I rented a room when I was 16, and uh, you know I did it myself, and I thought if I could just help six kids have this experience that I had because I had dinner every night at 7 o'clock and the family talked about college, career, music, and the arts. And I'd never seen or heard anything like it. And it's a great program. And that's how I founded the charity and that's how I designed it after that. Basically, it's a family unit that the charity's uh, formed after. So about 2,000 kids. We can reach them. They're there. We have repeat kids. They, we have special events throughout the year. We bring the kids and introduce them to these concepts. Uh, honesty, self-respect, and integrity are, are huge focuses for us. We teach those kids those three concepts, uh, as well as many others. So we bring them there. We bring them to special events. We teach them etiquette and manners, uh, give them motivation speeches, tell them how to get jobs, what good work habits are, how to network, things of that nature. And uh, we have repeat kids, and you can really see the difference. It's tremendous the way the kids change right at our event when they see people such as yourselves and these other people in the community, you know, reaching out with love, you know, and, and that's the important thing. Any other questions from mm -hmm. council members? I just have a comment. Thank you for doing such great work, well, really, and bringing and introducing it to the Ohio Valley because I'm sure there's people that are going to benefit from it. So thank you. Thank Mr. you very Williams. much. And thank you all. Thank you, council, for having us. Have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Okay, at this point on the agenda, it, this point is set aside for public communications, issues that are not agendized, that are not on our agenda. And if you haven't filled out a card, I would ask you to do so. Um, limit your comments to three minutes. And remember that the council if it's an unagendized item, the council will not get into discussion on it or take any action on it. Uh, but it may be referred to staff and placed on a future agenda. So keep that, keep in mind the council will not take any action. We're here to receive your comments, to receive your input. And before we get into the speaker cards, Mr. Clark was to, would like to introduce our new community development director. That's great, Kathy, could you stand up? Um, Kathleen Wald has just been appointed our new uh, community development director. Uh, she comes to us from uh, the city of Morro Bay and she's uh, worked in municipal planning for over 20 years. Yeah, yes. And uh, has, I was very impressed with how broad her experience is in current planning, advanced planning, code enforcement supervision a lot of things that we need here. So it's my pleasure to introduce her and welcome to town. 
Thank you. And so um, I'm very happy to meet all of you and as well as the people in the audience and the community. And I just like to say that everywhere I go, it seems like I'm sort of already known. So I get, I'm really looking forward to meeting and, and um, actually knowing the names of my fellow people here in Ojai. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm just going to go through my cards in the order that I have them. It may not be the order in which you turn them in. Um, Michael Shanahan. Good evening. My name is Michael Shanahan. I'm at uh, 1120 Golden West Avenue here in Ojai. I am a new resident of Ojai, and I'm enjoying it immensely. Um, and this issue is a new issue to me. I'm here to speak about the cell tower, obviously. I think you probably guessed that most of us are. What I've observed is a failure of process. And the, when a process fails, as, as this appears to have done in terms of the notice period and the community response and the community involvement, the worst thing that happens is the merits and the discussion about the merits get totally obfuscated. It, 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 the, the, the conversation revolves around the process, people's deprived rights of speaking, people's right to be informed, and nobody talks about the problem, whether there is a problem, whether this is the solution, and whether it should be implemented. And so I'm here in very brief to urge this, this council to consider a restart of this process uh, and to do it in a, in a way that gives proper notice to the community, that doesn't divide the community, that doesn't appear that you were, not you specifically, that doesn't appear that the city was seeking to avoid community participation, which is what it looks like. I, I don't know what it is. But in, a, in an issue this important, it seems to me, and in a community this small where the community relationship is this important, that it would be more important to restart the process, give the community the involvement that it's asking for, and make sure the decision, whatever it is, is made on a sound basis with proper input. I think that's the Ojai way that I've been introduced to, and it's the Ojai way that I'd like to see continued. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, Mr. Clark, was, uh, can you explain the process as to where we are and how we got to where we are? It, was there a lack of notice? Wasn't weren't people informed? And where are we in terms of it going before the Planning Commission? Wasn't it the first time before the Planning Commission last week? That's correct. So, so an application came in and an environmental um, document was prepared. The notice for comment on that was um, inadequate. And when we learned that it was inadequate, we um, canceled the public hearing on the project and made it a public workshop so that the citizens could come and talk to the Planning Commission, but the Planning Commission wasn't in a position to uh, take action on the application. And we extended the, uh, the comment period. Um, at this point in time, our understanding is that the applicant may um, resubmit their application, possibly in different format, and we will be in, put in a position where we need to evaluate that and, and have a, a public process. That hasn't been scheduled yet. We haven't received an application yet. And so the ball's kind of in their court on that. Um, in the meantime, we've been having discussions about what we need to do as a, as a um, city to be prepared for potential receipt of that application or other applications and to make sure that we're able to handle it in an appropriate way and also make sure that adequate public input's provided. Does the city have a uh, uh, absolute uh, police power over the issuance of the permit or is somehow uh, a federal preemption involved in this? Madam Mayor, members of the council, um, there is a both state and federal preemption on this issue of, uh, about the uh, construction of cell facilities in the city. We have a lot of land use control over where uh, characteristics um, is constrained by the fact that we cannot have a, a process 
that makes it infeasible for cell providers to provide a signal, an adequate signal, um, uh, to all their subscribers in the area. Um, the system we have is a conditional use permit for any cell facilities, um, and which weighs the uh, the impacts of the proposed project on the uh, on the community where it's being located, and that's what is currently being processed. Mm -hmm. But we have a significant amount of control, but we cannot ban them, um, and we can't adopt a practice that makes it overly burdensome or infeasible to or impracticable to actually uh, construct them. But that doesn't have to be necessarily that, that it has to be in the form of a, a standalone tower. There's other technologies that, that um, exist today that are newer than a few years ago. Um, and, and that should be part of the analysis of alternatives to the, what they propose to construct. And one last question. Where does the final um, initial approval sit? Does it sit with the Planning Commission and it would only get before us on an appeal? That's correct. Don't, thank you. I don't have any other further questions. Okay, our next speaker, Bob Daddy. Thank you very much, Bob Daddy. Oh, hi. Um, I came to this meeting, the commissioner's meeting, to talk about the cell tower and see what was going on. Um, I had to get up after about 30 minutes because for the 29-minute period that you can look at on the tape, we had some contract contract uh, planners really tell us something that I was kind of shocked at or somebody I respect very much Cordis Kohler he's one of our past planning commissioners and I remember him saying to staff your job is to tell us what we can do not what we can't do and we listened for 29 minutes as a community and it seemed like we were talked down to and scolded about what we couldn't do. You can't do this for all of these myriad of reasons. I think that was incredibly unfair. It was totally unbalanced. As all of you ran for council, you talked about transparency and fairness and balance, and I did not see that at that meeting whatsoever. It appeared that those people here were only representative of the applicant and not the people that pay taxes or reside in this community. And I'd like to see that reset. And I'd like you to do whatever you need to do, but I think staff needs to take a look. We've had RENCON for years, and maybe it's time for another RFP. Maybe it is time for us to get a different, fresh look. We seem to be getting the same type of thing, and we've had this contract for years. I think it's time for us to look at all of the outside people that we have advised us about our community and the value of our lives. And then the last thing, just by coincidence, uh, Greg Grant has been um, getting calls from me of late. We have another dead tree, which happens to be outside uh, Councilman Blatz's office. That thing died just in a couple of days. We're really having a rash of these conifers die all over the community. It is really getting to be hazardous. Now, I've contacted Ventura County <laughs> Fire. I've been on them for a couple months, and I haven't had any help. I do remember our uh, city attorney, Mr. Fletcher, talking about the awesome police power that the city has. And I'm hoping whether it's an emergency ordinance to have people remove these extremely hazardous burning, soon to be burning bushes around here. But I would like you to spend a minute, if you can, later in the presentation and talk to your, your public works. Uh, manager, Mr. Grant, because he and I have discussed it, and we have virtually dozens, if not hundreds, of these trees that are dead and standing that really present a very clear hazard, something on the amount we're getting to be Oakland Hills with the drought we have. And we need to, we need to start removing this stuff now. Thank you. <coughs> Dennis Leary. Good evening. I just said to Bob, it's a hard act, act to follow. Um, I want to talk to you um, not about fire, but about water. Uh, the drought is the background of it. 
couple years ago, I, I made a suggestion that the city drill its own well for drinking and cooking water. <coughs> and I, I don't know if Mr. Clark remembers, but I talked to him about it and some other people. And uh, it didn't really, you know, there was, wasn't the impetus there and it didn't quite seem feasible and there's multiple objections. But now with the drought and the headlines from Friday's paper, OVN, uh, I want to take another look at it and discuss it with you. I think it's a safety and health issue, at least for somebody like me. Even if we win the case with Casitas, it'll be an improvement, but it's not an ideal situation from my point of view. We're still going to have water piped horizontally through these pipes and chlorine is added to it. Chlorine is a is a toxic thing. It's, it's, a, it's a poison, really. So a lot of people don't, how many of us drink the water from the tap? You know, people buy water, bottled water, or they have elaborate uh, filtration systems and so on, because the water nowadays is really iffy. But there's a lot of people in our community that really don't understand that they're probably drinking tap water and, uh, and many of them include children, mothers, and so on. It's not a safe situation. So I'm looking at it, um, even with casitas. I mean, what if we have drought for a few years? What if casitas dries up? You say, oh, that's not going to happen. God isn't going to do that to us. How do we know? I mean, we can't play God. We don't know what's going to happen. But uh, the responsibility of government, as far as I can see, is to really prepare for the worst. Hope for the best. Prepare for the worst. So now is the time to start looking at these things. Now, if you have your own well, the city, we have control of it. Because see this, you've got one-fifth control, maybe. And then it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be a real deal if we get uh, short. Anyway, I wrote an article and I submitted it to the OVN yesterday by email, in which I, had, I expanded on my idea. Is that, and I know there's, in your mind you're thinking all kinds of objections, especially money. We don't have the money. Well, if we would waste money, like on, excuse me for saying this again, but Libby Bowl, we'd have a million dollars to drill a deep well. In drought conditions, you have to adjust. You have to go where the water is, and it's going to be deep, down to bedrock, maybe in the bedrock. And if you get the sweet water in the bedrock, you really got a nice treasure. So just an idea I want to bring up again is uh, think about it. In addition to Gasitas, we need our own source for drinking and cooking only. That's a safety health issue. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Etta Haddon. Good evening, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to address you. Perhaps some of the problem, oh, my name is Etta Haddon. I live at 421 Los Alamos Drive. And yes, I'm here also as a result of the cell tower project. My concern, and I wish to address you about it also, is the notice, which has already been mentioned. It was pretty unsettling to come home from a trip after a Christmas break with my grandchildren and tacked to my door on the 29th of December was a notice that said, oh, by the way, you have to get your comments in on this uh, environmental impact report by Monday. So it was just, it was shocking to me because I live in an environment where due process is part of um, a primary consideration and there just wasn't any here. The other part that concerns me about this is that when asked why, what happened, how come, there have been no satisfactory answers as to why our community was really blindsided by this lack of notice and lack of due process. The other um, issue that I want to bring up to you uh, is really critical to the whole community and not just this one cell tower. And that is that uh, with the enactment of the 2012 um, middle class tax reform act there are provisions in there that um, have limited or put limitations on cities in relation to modification of cell towers this is an extremely critical issue every time a cell tower comes in there's more limitation on the city as to how much you can do to prevent 
unwieldy modifications of it. So my suggestion is that as a community, we need to hire someone who is really an expert in preparing ordinances to properly prepare an ordinance, a telecommunications ordinance for the city of Ojai. There are folks out there that specialize in that, and I'm just highly encouraging and recommending that we all really take a look at this because it will impact this entire community. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm, I'm having a little difficulty reading the last name. Dave, is that an Catlett. 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 I tried to make that C and L. It was. Yeah, my penmanship sometimes a little sloppy. <laughs> I'm Dave Catlett. Uh, I live at uh, 1206 San, Rome, San Ramon Way. Um, I lived at this address for 17 years. I've lived in the Ojai Valley since 1968. I've worked in Ojai for 34 and a half years. The proposed cell tower is about 250 w feet away from our home. I'm going to cut to the chase here. The city, the planning department have not been very transparent to the residents that live in this area. And I'm not talking about the 300 feet that got a letter. I would think the radius area to respond should have been to the whole town. You, the members of the city council, would not like to live next to a tower, I'm sure. I'm also sure you would not approve this if it was to be put in Libby Park or behind the arcade. You don't even like some businesses to be approved in Bryant Street, and it's zoned for this. The council and the city planners need to address the issue of cell towers in the city limits and do it fast next to the densely, especially next to the densely populated homes. We don't want this next to us, and a large amount of surrounding homes in the area don't either. Now I know AT&T is hell-bent on putting their tower in this particular location. And I also know that there's a bunch of different areas that they can put this far away from us. It doesn't need to be in the densely populated area. So I feel that you guys need to put a kibosh to this because AT&T, if they do go in there, they can sublease this to other cell tower places too. So there just wouldn't be them, which have 12 supposedly antennas. There could be a total of 48 because there's three other cell companies that can sublease to this joint. So our place is really going to be blasted. I'm retired. I really don't want to move yet, but you guys are forcing me, and I really hate that. So I wish you guys could really do the right thing for us and the town itself. Thank you. I'll ask that you hold your applause after a speaker finishes and for a very selfish reason. I like to ponder for a, a few moments after a speaker finishes um, and this, the time between speakers gives me that time to do that. But when you applaud, that immediately shifts my attention to the audience instead of what the speaker has just said. So I'll ask you to hold your applause. Our next speaker is Joe Haddon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. And I'm going to pluck a string that's already been plucked several times tonight. And that was a notice. We came home from our vacation uh, with relatives for Christmas. We came home Sunday evening and there was that notice taped to the door telling us we had until the next day to uh, participate in the selection of this tower site. Um, that doesn't even have a fig leaf of due process. This is a 65 foot permanent structure and uh, from our house it's a straight shot right to the tower or would be. Um, and Obviously, it was an error, but for someone to give notice on Friday and say that notice time runs out on Monday, it's hard to imagine there was a mistake in the arithmetic. Um, this is a very significant thing, and one I hope that the citizens and the city can work together on. 
There, it's been pointed out, there are a lot of restrictions, federal restrictions, and state probably, too, about what you can and can't do. But certainly the location of these sites is well within uh, the spread of the authority of this city. And uh, I've been given to understand that something like 14 different sites have been offered to AT&T. Um, and it is increasingly uh, subject to federal and state jurisdiction. Um, and I spoke to a city uh, council person in Northern California, and they indicated to me that the city that has the gym of zoning ordinances for telecommunication towers is Calabasas. And today I spoke to the planner in Calabasas, and they'd be pleased to share with us their ordinance. It doesn't mean it's perfect, but it might give us some ideas. And I think we all work for the same goal. We want a good city. This is Ojai. And uh, when you cut the people out that way, that's a mistake. It's a mistake strategically, and it's a mistake practically. And while I'm here, I'll say one word. The first one, that's safe harbor. Great stuff. Kids in foster homes are the most vulnerable of all the kids in the county. They deserve all the help we can give them. And the people here behind me uh, all want to help you. And I'm sure you all want to help them. But it works better when we work together. Thank you very much. And before the next speaker, I, I want to mention that the city manager has addressed the uh, noticing problem already, but after all of the speakers, I'll ask that he address it again. Our next speaker, Jan Lewis. Mayor and council members, thank you for this opportunity. I live at 301 Oriole Street. So I'm not right next to the tower location that's proposed, but I am in the neighborhood. And I'm a realtor. I've been a realtor for 42 of my 63 years. <laughs> and I can tell you with experience that if the tower goes in, these kind people are gonna lose value on their homes. We have lots of things we have to disclose in Ohio. Lots of things that buyers who are potential buyers come to Ojai wanting to have a home and we have to tell them all the bad stuff. And let me tell you, this tower is bad stuff. They're not gonna be happy. So all these lovely people who are thinking of maybe retiring and moving or want to sell their home for some other reason, they're gonna lose value when they do so. And when homes go down in value, taxes go down in value and that's important to the city. I was sitting here thinking to myself, if I personally wanted to rent my backyard at 301 Oriole to AT&T to put a cell tower, could I do that? Would that be legal? Or would the FCC laws say that I had to let them because they're AT&T? I'm really concerned that we're being pushed around by federal laws that protect the communication system. And I hope that the council will work with the planning commission and somehow find a better location for this tower. This is not the right place to put it. There are too many lovely homes that are gonna have to look at it, hear it, know about it. And not only is it gonna affect them when they sell their home, they're gonna be distracted. People are so upset by this. And I know that the combination of the short notice and the fact that they feel like they don't have a choice, they feel like this is being forced on them, and that's a really bad combination. So I thank you so much for allowing me to speak, and I hope that we have a better answer to this than what's been proposed so far. Thank you. Mayor, I have a question. <clears throat> Do you have any idea what percentage a home will be devalued? That's it I'm very so vague? sorry. In Ojai, we have so few statistics. Mm. When you sell your home, it's even harder for an appraiser to come up with a value based on 
so few sales. Gotcha. Our inventory is extremely low. We only have 81 homes for sale in the Ohio Valley right now. Mm -hmm. So I wish I could. It's been said to me, the same question has been said to me by other people, wanting to know, is it going to be 20%, 30%? I think the biggest problem is people are not going to want to buy the homes. It's not a specific percentage. It's the inability. It's not going to be marketable at all. Correct. Okay. People will go elsewhere. Okay, thanks. Thank you for your question. I have a speaker card for Don and Linda, but I'm going Don and Linda Law, but I'm going to ask if the intent was to for both of you to speak or did you wish to speak together? No, just myself. On okay. Linda. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don Law. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to you tonight. I have to, I, incidentally, my name is Don Law, and I live at 1207 San Ramon Way. And I'll open by saying that I don't like confrontation. And tonight, essentially, on behalf of the people behind me, this is a confrontation to, of all people, my city council. But I have no choice for the reasons just stated by Jan Lewis. My wife and I are deeply concerned about the drop in, in property value. and. Um, the reduced um, uh, appeal that was also mentioned, and, and frankly, the possibility of damage from radiation. And I know you sweep that aside, as does AT&T, but the internet is rife with worldwide uh, articles about the damage to health done by radiation. I'll leave it at that, because uh, that has already been addressed by AT&T. It is obvious to this body that when you propose something like this, that, that you just open a can of worms, and, and I think that's been demonstrated at last week's meeting and this week's meeting. We are angry, disappointed, puzzled. Uh, I wouldn't be quite as puzzled if you didn't have alternative sites, but it was, I know of five sites that have been offered right across Grand Avenue in the Groves. Um, and now I heard the, the number of 14 or 15, which amazes me. Now, with that option, it seems to me that you could move across Grand, and if it goes a mile left or right, what's the difference? With the technology and the, the strength of microwave and cell tower transmission, you can't tell me that a mile makes that much difference to AT&T. Raises question in my mind, um, well, let me go on to the survival of the little tiny preschool that exists in the church. They rent space from the church, and you've, been, you've heard this many times before, and I want to reinforce that. I went to talk to the director of that school about two or three weeks ago, and she is terribly upset. She has a group of about 15 little kids in there, and she anticipates a drop in student body if it hasn't already started. I'm, I would be surprised. Um, that school probably will not make it, and, and they pay rent to the church. The church has an average of 10 cars in there, so it's going to be damaging financially to the church if that school closes. And my, my last question is, is it worth it to the city to take this on? I don't understand your position. I was a small business owner for 15 years. I dealt with business logic every single day. This is not logical. If you didn't have an alternative site, I could understand it, but I don't understand what is the gain to the city of OI. Thank you. Madam Mayor, I, I uh, would like to comment on what Mr. Law said. First, Mr. Law, you, you somehow have the impression that we sweep aside the radiation effects. That's clearly uh, something that you have not followed us with the smart meters. We have uh, passed an ordinance against smart meters in our town. So there is clearly nothing on our record as this city council that would indicate that we are anything but concerned about the radiation effects of the tower. The second thing is don't put us together with AT&T. If anything, this council takes an adverse position to big corporations and people that want to force themselves on this city. We do it on the state and we do it in all kinds of ways. So it's not us that's trying to put the cell tower there. We have an application before us and we have to act on that application. We certainly are not telling them that that's where we want it. 
and we certainly are not going to stand for them putting it there if it's not in the best interest of our city. But the impression that you, you are leaving me with is you think somehow we are in cahoots with them, which we're clearly not. We're looking for the best interests of our city. And just check the record of this council, and you'll see time and time again we have acted on behalf of the city and against big corporations when it comes to the actions of this council. The way the timing has been handled thus far, that is the impression given. That's fine. We didn't have anything to do with that timing, this council. If staff made a mistake with the timing, we can correct that. And we are correcting it. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd like to make a comment. And that is, this issue is not before the city council this evening. And so you're not going to get a lot of position taking from this council because it's not before us. It would not be proper. But what we are dis doing is we are listening to you, which is what we can do. And at the end of the, the conversation, we'll ask the st city staff to give you some um, additional answers. But I just want you to understand that we are here, we are your servants, we are listening. And that's all we can do this evening. Council Member Clapp. Just real quick clarification too. We didn't choose that location. The location was a negotiation between AT&T and the Lutheran Church. We had nothing to do with that. So I want to clarify that as well. No more. No, you've sp no, no, you've spoken. You, I'm sorry. I just wanted that clear because I think we got to. We have to clarify stuff at this point because too much is flying around the, the city. That's it's starting to get a little screwy. So I just want that made real clear as well. Okay, our next speaker, Jeff Lobel. Good evening. My name is Jeff Lobel. I live with my family at 1126 Paseo del Robles Court, Ojai. I'm here because the council's leadership is required to correct and to repair the damage done by the city staff in mishandling this application. Specifically, with respect to what Councilwoman Clapp just said, on July the 22nd, Mr. Mullane indicated that the application was incomplete in part because the alternative cell sites were not provided. October 31st, um, Mrs. McLaughlin said that the cell site the application was complete without requiring those alternative sites. So I take issue with the idea that the city did not take this particular site. It did because it rejected it, then it accepted it. I understand that's not before this body, but our impression is that the city worked with AT&T to pick this and only this site in contravention of the city's own code and the Telecommunications Act of 1996. So I understand there's a disconnect and I appreciate the fact that you bring it up, but there's a lot of feelings here with respect to what has occurred and it's important that it be clear that we have been trying to understand the city's position and have had some problems in doing so. For instance, um, we, I, I tried to obtain public records, public records from Rencon Consulting, because in my mind, they are signing as a city employee over Anne McLaughlin's name on the environmental report, which by the way was not an EIR. I couldn't get those documents. As far as I know, they do not exist. Therefore, there's a, there's a transparency problem, which gives rise to, I think, some of the frustrations you hear from the people behind me. I find it troubling that the city is now waiting for AT&T to respond. There's an application, note, it's been noticed, notice it again, reject it, if you really want to deal with this. But when you drag it out as you have, you affect all of our lives on a daily basis. A lot of people have put hundreds of hours into this. And quite honestly, we don't think that the city staff, not the council, but the city staff has been on our side. If they had been, the application requirements would have been met. They weren't. The city's own people said they had, at and had to do certain things and then didn't make them do it. So it seems to me that the, what I would like to see come out of this, I know that you cannot do the planning commission's job, but the planning commission can't control the planning department. The application 
and the planning, the, the EIR, or not, excuse me, not the EIR, but the so-called initial study was woefully inadequate in a number of ways. Are we going to now go back and use that same firm again to do another lousy job? Who's going to pay them the $10,000 for the second study if they choose other locations? The, I, I believe that the council's leadership needs to be heard, and I'm hearing it quite loudly <laughs> already, that, that there are serious problems with the way this was handled, and to not deal with that is going to cause the same problem to come up again. And quite honestly, we don't have the faith that the planning department, with all due respect to the new director, is going to do it any differently than it was done before, because you're using RENCON again on, by the way, a 2006 contract. I find that to be troubling from the point of view of the residents who, quite honestly, have had their experience severely damaged. No one can sell their houses now. I mean, you can drag this out for six months, but we're hurt every day. And, and I don't believe the city should put us in that position. Finally, I know my time is running down, but there is a 150-day um, application to conclusion requirement within, I believe, the Telecommunications Act. I'm sure Mr. Fletcher knows this better than I do. That 150 days hasn't been told that I know of. I mean, I know Mr. Clark has said we're waiting for some other document to come in, but where is it in writing? Has it been told? Has AT&T agreed that it's not going to be um, holding you to the 150 days? At 150 days, you have fewer choices. They would love to get you caught in that trap. And, and I, I think that, that there needs to be a greater clarity, and it needs to be in writing. I went and looked today. There was nothing from AT&T. Those city staff is telling people this won't go through. I find, I find that behavior extremely troubling and disingenuous and and not the way we should be treated. But thank you very much. Next speaker, Michelle Thomas. Madam Mayor, council members, thank you. And I don't usually do this, so bear with me. Um, I am Michelle Thomas. I live at 1125 Del Prado Court. My property or our property, my family's property, backs directly up to the meadow that the Lutheran Church owns. Uh, I've lived in Ojai for 30 years in the same home. My home and those of my neighbors will be directly negatively impacted by the AT&T cell tower project. That's, of course, contrary to what I read in the initial study of the environmental impact report i read a document here at the planning commission window i went through it page by page what i found was that it's it the statement it stated that the project would cause no significant impacts mm -hmm. that's not true these impacts are significant to myself and my neighbors the project as one of my neighbors stated will negatively impact our property values. That's a fact. My family and I have enjoyed the pink moment from our backyard for the past 30 years. Our view and that of my neighbors will be destroyed by this project. That's a fact. And that's a significant impact. Further, the region where the cell tower is to be placed is a wetland. No one probably remembers because it's been dry for many years, but in rainy years, that whole meadow turns into a pond. It's, there's a very high water table there. I hear frogs. I've seen herons fishing in that meadow. That's a significant impact. There's hawks that I've seen for, tw for 30 years raising babies in a tall tree in that meadow. The, the hawks, the frogs, all the wildlife in the area will be significantly impacted. Everyone is addressed, so I'm not going to belabor the, um, the process or lack thereof of notification. I was also out of town while this whole thing happened. I came home on the 18th and opened my mail and was completely appalled that I'd missed, I thought, the whole um, chance to speak about it, so I do uh, appreciate the fact that you're listening to us now, and I do realize that it's you're just taking information right now. But I am very upset that last week on uh, January 22nd, I came to City Hall to ask questions. I was told by an employee that the application had been withdrawn, and now I find out that that is completely not true. So I'm wondering, 
did again did did the city planning department not investigate it or were they just unclear was it a mistake whatever it's really stressful to all of my neighbors and myself um, I ask that the council consider this project with my testimony in mind from myself my family my neighbors for everybody involved this project is really bad for our community it's bad for local property values it's potentially disruptive to our local wildlife. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Bruce. Thank you. <laughs> That's uh, my wife. And uh, I'll ask you the same as I asked earlier. It's Bruce and Inez. Did you want to, did you wish to speak individually or together? Or well, we if you both would like to speak. We, we, we live together. We'll speak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we can do it either way. All right. Go ahead. You can start. All right. Hi. Um, we are Inez and Bruce Canvasser, and we reside at 1119 Paseo del Robles, which is within the 300 meters of the proposed AT&T cell tower. We have lived here for 10 years and chose this area because of the views of the mountains, the proximity to town, and the quiet neighborhood. We purchased our property after working hard for many years in the field of preventative health. We are absolutely opposed to this cell tower in such a medium density residential neighborhood. Um, I was gonna say just because the church is a commercial, but it's one, you know, it's one building and the whole rest is residential. Um, we pay property tax, our house is a substantial investment. We should have a say as to what goes on in our neighborhood and our beloved city of Ojai. We are not opposed to cell towers, but they should be away from residences, schools, etc. Although they say this 65-foot tower will be disguised in an artificial tree, it will change the aesthetics of the neighborhood. The tower on the Kale Trans property is quite an eyesore. Also, our peace and quiet will be disrupted. Presently, we, we can hear the birds, and a huge generator and air conditioner going day and night is unacceptable. Um, there are many studies, uh, and we won't get into all of them, and I'm sure we'll try to present a lot of them. I'm a naturopathic physician, and I've had to serve the governor of in the state of Oregon and naturopathic licensing board, actually two different governors. So I've had to sit and uh, make uh, hard decisions and listen to, for hours, to uh, complaints on doctors and write laws and whatever. But um, I always believed as a uh, naturopathic physician that we should err on the side of being very conservative. And the very fact of the matter that uh, many studies by the federal government or the uh, American Cancer Society, whatever, might say that it's fine. There are many other studies from different governments, from countries, that say different. So we, uh, I believe as a physician, I always tried to err on the conservative side. And on that point. Right. That, that law has not been changed since 1996. Right. So within those 20, 20 years, you know, there's right. been a lot of research, even yeah. though they haven't changed right. the law. Just like in medicine, we have black box codes. They change all the time sometimes. If we find out a little bit more about a, a medicine, we have to change it. The same with dietary supplements. Section of the city code, I'll leave it at that, 10-21712 City Municipal Code. And I'm not an attorney, and it says, it straight strongly that it encourages the location of cell towers to be in non-residential areas in order to reduce any adverse impact on the community. Well, you can see, I think we already have impact. But I'm glad to hear that you've let us uh, speak, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next P speaker, Pete LaFollette. Thank you, Mayor Strubble. Yes, hello, Pete LaFollette, 999 East Ohio Avenue. Before my specific item, just the, the general discussion on health and safety standards are not only the right and the mandate of citizens, 
but it, it, it's really the vital signs of the community to have good and strong health and safety standards being watched over. Um, my specific item, uh, at Whispering Oaks, we're still waiting for the pedestrian crossing signs at the foot of the, dr uh, the, the drive there. There's been several close calls since uh, last publicized. There's no barrier warning. Um, going into the drive or speed warning signs in the depths of the driveway so there continues to be uh, uh, threats there to citizens not only myself but but to older elderly people that can't jump out of the way when when cars speed in there at the same avenue that they do off of Ojai Avenue and they don't slow down so could you pass those comments on to 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 the engineering department and also Caltrans just to make the simple adjustment about put some pedestrian warning signs in the driveway thank you very much Our next speaker, Wayne Maynard. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. So my name is Wayne Maynard. I live at 609 Gridley Road, uh, which is also 406 Los Alamos, which is two houses on the same property, and we're right adjacent to the Lutheran Church. Um, today, I'd, I'd like to ask the, the Council to direct uh, the city staff to require AT&T to comply with all of the municipal code requirements, particularly the requirement of alternative uh, sites. Your municipal code says that uh, as part of the application that they should include a reasonable number of alternative sites. To me, that implies a decision has to be made if you have alternative sites. And I believe staff has given that authority back to AT&T. Uh, there was one alternative site identified in the document, was a piece of property across the street on Grand. And AT&T stated in their document that they determined it wasn't as technically feasible as the site at the Lutheran Church. And to me, that's the city staff giving away the authority of the city to make decisions, and that's not appropriate. So I would like you to direct your staff to enforce that provision of the municipal code to require alternative sites, um, include it in the negative declaration so that the, multiple, the other sites can be evaluated in the environmental document so that a decision can be made. Which site is going to have the least amount of environmental impacts? I can guarantee you if you pick another site, you're not going to have to remove a protected mature sycamore tree, which is very sad to me to have to remove that. Anyway, um, those are my comments. Don't give your authority away to the, to the applicant. You know, make the decisions. Thank you. Our next speaker is Loren Sims. Hi, thank you for having me here. I don't want to be here. I'm Loran Sims, 1202 San Ramon Way. Our bedroom window is 200 feet at the most from this cell tower. I can't sleep at night. I still can't sleep at night. It's been a month. He can't sleep at night either. And he's a doctor. It's terrible what this has done to our lives. I've lived here 51 years, with the exception of the time that I've been away to get further graduate education. We moved back here to practice medicine, to raise our family, to be here for our parents. My father-in-law, age 95 and a half, who we have to take care of when he needs us to. Our cell phones work fine, never had a problem. In our medical office for the last four weeks, I have been doing nothing but asking people that come in the door, do you have a problem with your cell service? I have not had one single person, listen to me, all of you listen to me, one single person say to me, I need better cell service. So what is this about? AT&T says it's an eighth of a mile each side. That's a quarter of a mile across, if my math's right. So who's getting the cell service? The orange trees don't need the cell service. That's where it's directed. An eighth of a mile, what is this? AT&T wants to get into this city. They want to put a cell tower somewhere. The Lutheran Church probably invited them here. I don't really know if that's true or not. And so, easy done. Goes through city staff, horrified, get this letter. I don't like to be treated like this after 51 years of loving this community. I frankly don't want to live here anymore. I don't want to live here anymore, and I'm not going to live here anymore if this is how city staff and the rest of you. Mr. Attorney, are you paying attention? Yes, I don't think you are. 
Could you please pay attention to me? Okay, I pay your salary. Address, address the council, please. He's part of it. You must understand, it's very destructive to all of us, all of my neighbors, to this whole community. If it was in any of your backyards, we wouldn't be here tonight because this cell tower wouldn't be here. How can you all not know what's going on with city staff? This started months and months and months ago. Months ago. I should have been a little smarter when I saw people drilling. I thought, oh, you must be drilling for water. Well, I was sure a fool. They weren't drilling for water. They were drilling to see what kind of land they were going to propose this thing on. You know, people were out there surveying. I'm really dumb. I didn't think anything like this could go on outside my bedroom window. Now, I can't live in my house. I can't sell my house. I can't rent my house. I can't do anything. I'm stuck, as are all my neighbors. 51 years of my life, 51 years, and it's come to this beautiful city of Ojai. People come here to relax and get away from it. And I don't want to live here anymore. So I beg all of you city, city council members, listen to us. This was a beautiful city, and we're losing it to AT&T and people like that. Thank you. Our next speaker, Dr. Raymond Sims. Good evening and thank you, council members. Um, Raymond Sims at 1202 San Ramon Way. Uh, <clears throat> as you've heard from my wife, we've been uh, obviously very emotionally upset by the proposed application for the cell tower. I've been a physician here for over 30 years. I've been uh, here for my patients 24 seven most of the time. And I have to have a quiet haven for me after so much stress to be able to relax from the stresses of my work and my life. Uh, I won't reiterate all the issues that have been raised by other people. I agree entirely with what they've said. I am concerned about the health impacts despite what uh, is stated and uh, am concerned. I appreciate your work on the smart meters. And I think the city of Ojai has been <coughs> trying to be very uh, forthright in terms of, of cutting edge, in terms of the uh, landscaping and uplighting, et cetera, plastic bags. So I want to urge you to listen carefully to everything that we've all said, and please take the leadership to consider this situation very carefully. We're all counting on you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Donna Miller. Very nervous. My name is Donna Miller. I reside at 574 Los Alamos Drive. I wanted to speak tonight to give this council an idea of the needless damage that will be done to Ojai as a community if you allow the cell tower to be constructed at 1290 Grand. My husband and I are relative newcomers to Ojai, moving from LA in 2007. We were looking for a place where neighbor meant more than just the house next door, and we certainly found that and more in Ojai. So for those of you who have lived here all your lives, you should be very proud not only of the physical beauty of Ojai, which you obviously treasure and protect, but also the warmth, the kindness, and openness of the residents themselves. You have woven the most amazing tapestry here, a tight-knit community of unbelievable richness, a community of people connected to each other as well as the valley itself. To answer the question of whether a 65-foot cell tower would adversely affect our neighborhood, let me give you some examples of what a resident on Los Alamos Drive might encounter on any given day. The sweet sounds of the children from the Ojai Valley Community Nursery School laughing and playing. During the spring and summer, two beautiful jacaranda trees in full bloom next to a stately mature sycamore. An unobstructed view of our splendid mountains neighbors working outside, walking their dogs, stopping to talk, sharing news, sharing homegrown fruits and vegetables, looking after each other and supporting each other. Make no mistake, the proposed cell tower will destroy all that in at least two ways. 
First, the nursery school will relocate for what loving parent wants their child 15 feet from a cell tower. So instead of listening to the music of children playing, we will hear the incessant din of an air conditioner and generator, not to mention the noise and disturbance created by routine or emergency maintenance, or what's worse, any future tower expansion or augmentation. For please keep in mind, if the cell tower is approved and constructed, OHI will have absolutely no power to control or regulate it. Second, at least two of my neighbors have decided to move if the cell tower is approved. Now you might think, well that's not a big deal because you would just get new neighbors, even though many realtors have stressed that the proposed location of the tower will negatively impact property values and tax revenues. But the idea that a nursery school, people who have lived in their homes for decades, or even established mature trees, can simply be removed and replaced to accommodate a 65-foot cell tower that can be relocated in a non-residential commercial area doesn't only threaten to pull at the fabric of this extraordinary community, it threatens to tear it apart. This council is sworn to uphold the laws of this community, to preserve the values that make Ojai unique, and to protect it from actions that will inflict great harm on its residents. I ask that you honor the trust this community has placed in you and reject the application. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Marilyn Smith. Good evening, thank you for allowing us to speak. Um, my name is Marilyn Smith. My husband Jack and I have been in Ojai since 1970. We've been in our home at 1209 San Ramon Way for over 23 years. Um, both of us have worked in the schools for over 40 years, so we're familiar with the community, familiar with our children, um, familiar with Ojai. We love Ojai, but now Jack and I are distressed. We're distressed of the thought of a cell phone tower in our residential neighborhood. We're distressed about the poor communication between the city and the neighbors. We're distressed about the poor communication between the church and its neighbors. We're distressed that there's no documented need for a, a wireless cell phone tower. We're just really distressed that the cell phone tower is proposed to be in a residential neighborhood rather than a commercial corridor or even agricultural or industrial area. I'm particularly distressed that it would be next to very small children or very elderly adults. We're distressed over the health impacts and we're distressed over the potential negative effects on property values. I know that the City Council operates as representatives of its citizens. Please consider the wishes of the citizens. We are opposed to the placement of the proposed tower. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Khaled Alawar. Did I get even close? Yeah. <laughs> you did it too well, it scares me. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor, Council Members, I'm very, well after I've listened to all these people, I got really kind of emotional because I do sense that their fears are very real and their concerns are very real. There's no question about it. This is not the first time Ojai faced such an intrusion on its life style in the quality of living that is here. Weldon Canyon is a definite example of that. In the last 32 years I've been living here, I've never been more proud how the city and the citizens and the residents of this valley rallied together and did stop the creation of Walden Canyon. Uh, this is a very special community. I've had the privilege of living in so many different 
places in the world. I was born actually in Africa. I lived in Lebanon. I lived in many, many places. And I've said it many times, I've never felt at home till I came to this place. This is a very special place, is a very sacred place. And, and the concerns of all the people who spoke are so real. And they are our friends and neighbors. And, uh, and I, <clears throat> we should not have a lot of faith in in studies that are conducted by multi-billion dollar corporations. Before I came to this country, I think was asbestos was allowed. And look what is happening today. You know, they, I, my understanding there's $30 billion that is set aside for people to be compensated from the result of what asbestos has done to their lives. I give you a, something that hits home. When DDT was actually made, you know, forbidden in this country, to tell you that multi-billion dollar corporations have no interest in, in the health of people, the citizens, or anything like that. Their main interest is the money that they will gather. They sent it overseas. And I cannot erase this image when, it was, it, when DDT went to Lebanon that my father was so happy. He would just gather with some of the farmers and he would say, look, there is nothing moving on that leaf. And guess what? Slowly, nothing was moving anywhere. It went through the animal chain. You know? So there were no more birds, no more butterflies, no more wolves, no more foxes or nothing like that. So we really do not know what is the long range effect of this particular you know, thing that the, uh, the, the, the cell towers and what is the radiation effect in the long term. And I'm sure they pay, have it in their budget you know, that one day they might have to pay a lot of money to, to, to compensate for people for their health and what have you. This is all high and I am so encouraged when Councilman Platt said what he said, and then uh, Madam Mayor and uh, Councilwoman Betsy Clark, that you are not here to okay or to do anything. That gives me a lot of encouragement because yes, you are our representatives, but you are citizens and residents of this valley first. And I think the concern of any individual in this valley is equal to your concern, you know, so, uh, AT&T is a multi-billion dollar corporation. They can, they can. It's easy, a little bit of a burden on them to put that tower, not in a residential area first, and in a place where nobody should really be affected, you know? So, you know, studies, could you imagine if we just gather some people and say, let's, let's see the effect of toba tobacco on, on people, and everybody smokes cigarettes and says, oh, nobody dropped dead then everything is okay. So there's the long range effect that nobody has studied. So I have all the trust in my heart that you will act accordingly and you will safeguard the citizens of this valley. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker, Deborah McCombs. Or McComas. That's <laughs> okay. Um, my name's Deborah McComas. I live at 407 Los Alamos Drive. I've lived there for 20 some years. I've raised two children there. And I don't want to repeat everything that's been said before. But as I sit here, and I've talked to some of my neighbors, and it's really hard. This is not my forte to get up and talk to anybody, really. But there are a lot, Jeff went and knocked on a lot of doors this past weekend. There's a lot of people that have no idea they don't take the Ohio Valley News. They don't know about the cell tower. In fact, they were shocked. And there are two ways to get to Pacalis or to Monica Ross or to San Antonio School or to any part of the East End. It's Ohio Avenue or it's Grand Avenue. Every day the cars go on Grand Avenue people taking their kids to school, people going to work, both directions all day long. And what are you looking at? You're looking at 
this beautiful community that we have. And if you, everybody says, okay, the cell tower is going to be behind the church. Well, that's about 90 degrees. What about the other 200 degrees behind it? We are going to see the whole 65 feet. It is not going to be hidden at all. If you go out to Vaughn's and you see the cell tower, what do you see? You see part of the cell tower. There's trees higher. Do you see the base of the tree? Do you see the base of the cell tower? You don't. But if you allow this cell tower to go on Grand Avenue, you will see it. If you walk down Los Alamos, if you walk, walk along, not Grand, but San Ramon Way, the people that drive out there, they're going to see every part of it. And even though you can say, or AT&T can say it only affects a small amount of people, I beg your pardon. This is an impact of our whole community. There are thousands of people. There are people that come into Ojai. They're riding their bikes, and I know they're not, they don't live here. They come here to, to just take part of our community. And I really hope and I pray that all of you have some guidance because I think there's been some lack of guidance. There's been loopholes. Something's been wrong with the situation. And there's a lot of people upset, but there's a lot more people that have no idea how it will impact. So thank you. Thank you. Nuri. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. My name is Nuri Ranagi. We are here, me and my children and grandch grandchild. Love Ohai, looking all over and decided to settle here after I was retired. It's a beautiful town and beautiful people. It was said those things were. I don't want to repeat. What I want to repeat is that it's your job representing people to do what people are asking you right now. The issue is the health of people and corporation making money. That's all it is. I have cell phone. All of you have. It's not the need of public for cell tower. It's the need of corporation for making big bundle. So let's at least have it somewhere that is safe to children, not in a daycare that after working so hard, my own daughter built it back up so beautifully for little children to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the speaker cards I have. Is there anyone else in the audience who would uh, like to speak? I'll, I'll start with Dale. She outran you. <coughs> Sorry. I, I, I've been waiting. I didn't hand in a card because I knew everyone was going to say everything I'm going to say. But I just so appreciate the comments from Colette and from Dr. Sims and others. You know, I, I know all of you are concerned as we are. And I know all of you will do the right thing. I, and I know that you will uh, correct the staff with some of the mistakes they've done because certainly they've not been transparent and they haven't done the process correctly. But um, I want to reiterate what um, Jan Lewis said about real estate values negatively impacted. We can't let that happen to our citizens. And I appreciate your concerns and I know you'll do the right thing for Ojai. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Seppi Day. I live at 404 Golden West. I'm not in the area that got a notice, but I'm just about a block or two away from there. And I've been looking at real estate in the area. I rent right now, and I've looked at at least 10 homes in the area to buy, and I've now asked my realtor to put a hold on it. I'm not going to look. I'm not going to buy in that area. I'm Nuri Ranagi's daughter, and um, I have a niece who's five years old, and she went to that preschool for two years. The two children that were here earlier tonight, one of them is her best friend. And she woke up the other morning out of a deep sleep saying, cell tower, go. No cell tower here. My sister goes to that school. I don't, we don't want cell tower there. 
And this is not something we're all, you know, obsessing about or talking about around her, but somehow it got into this five-year-old's mind, and these two kids came here tonight because their dad said, hey, do you want to go and try and save our school? And um, I I'm floored that the city that we carefully chose that has such a reputation and that um, we came here because we believe it's, we share the values of, of looking out for the safety, the well-being, the, the peace, the views, the, you know, AT&T could not put a shop in that location, and yet the, the notion that they could put a cell tower there is, is um, really uh, disappointing to all of us. So I'm really hopeful that, uh, I, I know there's got to be a way that we can get it in a, in a better location, and uh, I can tell you as a buyer, I have no interest, I will, I'll never, I, I can't imagine ever buying a home and putting my five-year-old niece or any child or my mother or, or even myself in an area where we're going to sleep near a cell tower. It just um, is not necessary, and right now you couldn't give me one of those homes. So good luck. Thank you. And are there any very young people here who would like to speak that we haven't heard from? <laughs> okay. Um, and before you, before you start responding, I had a couple of questions. One, would, would, um, a zone change be required on that property to put the cell tower? And you don't have to answer me, but uh, because isn't it no. uh, quasi-public? It's permitted. It's, it's among the conditionally permitted uses in that zone. Okay. And does the county of Ventura have a cell tower ordinance regulations, and is that possibly why uh, alternative sites outside the city limits are not considered? Yeah, I, you probably can't answer that either. Uh, I can't uh, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that, but I just yeah. want to get the questions out there so that, it, that they can be considered in some responses. And the other thing is um, environmentally, that I know that property is um, it's just a mass of artesian springs. And so does that constitute environmentally a reason to for additional reports or anything so may, let me give some make some general comments and sort of broad brush you know as I as I tried to say earlier what we're doing now is trying to position ourselves so that this can be handled properly going forward so the first thing we're talking about doing is retaining the services of a technical consultant with expertise in cell towers and cell tower technology who is capable of providing independent review of any materials that are submitted by an applicant, whether it's this or another one, and who's in a position to help us identify technically feasible alternatives to any proposed uh, cell tower that we're, we're going to come in. So that's something that we plan on proceeding with right away, but probably bringing back to the council for further approval. Um, secondly, um, I think there's a valid comment out there that alternatives had not been um, properly identified and reviewed as part of this uh, application. And so we will require that with this application or any other application, that there be an adequate and thorough identification and review of alternatives. Um, and that would include independent technical review um, from the applicant um, through this technical consultant. Um, the other, another issue that's been brought up, and you just brought it up uh, as well as a number of speakers, is the adequacy of the sequel review. So um, we will make sure that this application, whether it comes back or any other application that comes in, um, is subject to proper sequel review. And most importantly, that the public notice uh, for that sequel review and for any public hearings will be um, as per law and, and adequately covered. So um, we, we also have been, and you asked about the, uh, the county, we have been in contact with the county, um, and we found out a couple things. First of all, generally speaking, their standard is very um, uh, lax, 
but in the Ojai Valley plan, they do have a 40-foot height limit with some leeway for um, taller heights. They are also initiating a review because they are receiving so many applications for cell towers within the county of cell tower policy countywide. And so um, that has just begun and, and or is just in the process of beginning. So uh, was there anything you needed to add, Joe? No, you covered that all. Any questions from? I just Council? have a, I, I would like to direct staff to come back to us and tell us what in the world happened with the procedural safeguards that we should have been afforded and the public should have been afforded when this application was being processed. I can't imagine that if the code requires that they provide alternate sites, that staff could arbitrarily say they don't need to provide it. I can't imagine how we can screw up notice timing. It makes absolutely no sense to me. And as a result of that, these poor people have been put into a position thinking that this project is probably a lot farther along than it already than it is. They think that we haven't had the oversight that we should have had. And quite frankly, I wish we could act on the project tonight, but we can't because it's all public, part of public comment. But uh, I think we should be looking at whatever we need to look at, Mr. Fletcher, with regard to time, place, and manner restrictions for these types of projects. We've got view sheds to worry about. We've got property values. And uh, how it, it got to the point where it already is, thank goodness it wasn't further along, but how it could get to the point where it is when we know in Ojai how critical we believe the thing about the uh, radiation effects as we've already shown when we've dealt with smart meters. The effects that we, we believe in, in uh, protecting ourselves from, from uh, large corporations. And that's why we don't allow large chain stores in town. And now to have the public feel as though this type of a project, which is unsightly and in an ill-suited place, can be shoved down their throat is very disappointing to me. So whatever we need to get back so that it, if nothing else, we can have it on our, in our agenda so that we're made aware of where this project is all the way along. I think we should have a, something on our agenda every meeting that's gonna tell us where this project is because we, at this point, do not have the authority to be able to act on anything with regard to the application, other than to assure that staff does exactly what they're supposed to do in terms of the procedural safeguards that we should have done the first time. So that's my recommendation. And I would like us to take a look at this project and have some, some legal input back to us on not necessarily looking at reasons why the project can't be approved, but at least give us the insight as to looking at it as we do with so many things in Ojai as to why we, why we shouldn't have it rather than why we should. And I think that would go a long way to creating some confidence in the public again. Yes. Madam Mayor. Right Another. <laughs> order. Madam Mayor. <laughs> Council Member Clapp. <laughs> Madam Mayor, another, another thing um, that I think is, well, first of all, I'm as embarrassed, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but I didn't know about this until it was on the front of the newspaper. Yeah. I didn't know it either. I'm, I'm as, as surprised as anybody. And I'm really disappointed in the fact that that happened. And I agree with uh, Council Member Blatz that I don't ever want that to happen again. Uh, the other thing is um, need. I, I also believe that AT&T needs to establish the need in the first place because it is clear that from the feedback from the citizens that have AT&T service that they are saying that they are not having problems with the reception. So I, I don't, is there any reason we can't require them to uh, establish a need? That actually is in our ordinance. That's what uh, they are required to submit as part of their application. As well as the alternative sites. Correct. It's in analyzing first what is what is the gaps or, or, or deficiencies in service and then what facilities are needed to bring that up to um, some industry standard. Okay, so CEQA, need, and alternative sites, correct? Correct. And another question. Um, they're the ones to, that are seek out the alternative sites, or can we suggest alternative sites, number one? And number two, 
can they are uh, if who would our independent person be uh, would they come in and say, <laughs> I don't know how to word this, would they come in and say, oh, this site is no good, according to our guy, and the, our person that we retain would ha say, well, no, that's not true, it is okay, and could they arbitrarily, I'm being very convoluted, it, it, maybe if I could they answer arbitrarily that. just dismiss another alternative site because they don't like it? The process is, as envisioned in our ordinance is that the, that the applicant establishes their service need and indicates a preferred site and a reasonable number of alternative sites that will achieve the same outcome. And we could and that has to have engineering support for it and then we are entitled to require them to put the deposit down with the city to pay for the cost of an independent consultant to analyze that and to give us feedback on the accuracy or inaccuracy. Um, and I don't know any reason why that couldn't possibly include also other alternative sites. Is there, and who gets the right to choose the alternative sites, this, one, two, or three, or four? The way our ordinance operates, it really, this is, it creates the record that the Planning Commission and, and or the City Council would rely upon to determine whether to approve their application. They still get to submit a preferred site, but the, uh, but the mm -hmm. service analysis as well as the alternative sites analysis get, creates for us the administrative record to establish whether in fact it is the um, the best site with the least adverse impact on the community. And that's what goes on in the public hearing. And I was going to say, we're probably I was just going to say outside the parameters we have not of short violated. Responses. We are very yes. close we to violating close. the Brown Act. But <laughs> given that we have we have not heard from Council Members. Madam Mayor, I, I, first of all, I appreciate the public being here. I absolutely am thankful for your input. Not only was it emotional, but it, you guys brought up some very valid points and same thing as my colleagues I, I I agree with all their comments I think that as a council member I am embarrassed that I didn't know about this until I read Mr. Lobel's letter very articulate he took a lot of time to write that letter right when he received that public hearing um, which was improperly done by our staff uh, but I just think that I wanted to also reiterate a council member's Blatt's uh, remarks about I wasn't going to go as far as putting it on every agenda, but I think we need to develop a timeline to be proactive on what we could do and what we can't do and have a clear clear uh, so that the public could understand and on and even go as far as to see what other th creative things we could do. I know that c the city of Calabasas uh, has already been, I actually have looked into their ordinance and it's been suggested by other people and I'm glad it brought, uh, was brought up today, but we are being proactive. I think that it is clear that uh, our, our citizens don't want it. I have two young girls, a four year old and a seven year old. I lived on Lark Ellen right below San Ramon Way. So I know, and I live right now next to Topa Topa. It's not too far away from there. So I have vetted interests also um, in the health concerns, but also I do, I do want to reiterate that um, we do have to be proactive whether AT&T is going to reapply or not. So thank you. Okay, and I think we've skirted as close to the <laughs> Brown Act as we need to go. <laughs> And I, I will I will mention though that um, I have a little bit of concern about placing placing it repeatedly on the council's agenda because of how that might be viewed since it is an issue before the planning commission. But that's that's all I'll say. Well, it isn't all I'll say. I never. Say every. <laughs> I, I would like to thank everyone for being here. All of you being here, taking the time, bringing your emotion, your frustration, your anxiety into this council room so that your council can listen to you is one reason this city is so great. I am very grateful and I appreciated hearing every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No applause. <laughs> You want to take a little break so everybody can leave? <laughs> <laughs>
We'll take a five minute break.
Okay, we're going to resume our council meeting, and I don't get to eat my cookie here, so. <laughs> All right, next on our agenda is the consent calendar, and I have a request to pull item J. Oh, dear. Which is? Uh, there's something I wanted to pull. Temporary labor, labor services agreement. And we have a couple of speaker cards for the uh, consent calendar. One is on item J, and one is on item 1E, which is the second reading of the ordinance related to the implementation component of the second dwelling unit compliance program. Um, let's go ahead and hear from Gail Topping. Good evening, council and staff. Uh, I never thought that I would be coming after such a um, two-hour harangue on, um, on the staff in particular. But I'm hoping you're all well. The city manager, Mr. Clark, Ms. McLaughlin, Deborah Pentry, and I have met several times since the adoption of the external light ordinance in August. These meetings refined the solutions which will... So, excuse me, I think yeah. this is actually on item number three. One. One E. One E. Second dwelling unit is what you have on your no. card. One E? Oh. Yep. Am I on... E I'm second. on the... Ex so, yes. Yeah, so... No, I'm in the wrong place then. <laughs> right. The, okay. the lighting ordinance is item number three. Oh, which we'll okay. get to in just a minute. Okay, so I'll call you again. When Will we you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Gail. <clears throat> okay, item um, 1J. Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, I decided to pull this item. I was reading uh, it's the Temporary Labor Service Agreement. And I just had a couple questions for staff. Uh, more than anything, I guess the appropriate questions would be directed to Mr. Grant. Um, I, I just thought that I, and I th uh, it would might be a good idea, and that's why I'm asking you to see if it's appropriate, if we could possibly enter an agreement with someone locally. And I was just thinking how great it would be to show somebody or give jobs here, like maybe the crew, and I don't know if that would fit what you're looking for, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. I, I did, and what my fellow council members thought about that. All right, well, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. And I know the crew, uh, I heard that uh, suggestion come up, and uh, unfortunately the crew doesn't really provide temporary labor services so much as the crew with a supervisor for specific work. But we will keep that in mind because the, I think the intention of this is there's two individuals, which uh, one is retired, one's on long-term leave, and uh, with the overhead and markup and so on, there's a pretty good significant savings to the budget every year. So we can use that money as we see fit. That's the intention here. We, it'll be staying within budget. So we could use the crew for specialized projects possibly, for instance, uh, weed clearing and other projects where they could hit it pretty hard there. And it'd be a very similar rate to what we're intending here with these temporary laborers, uh, possibly even less. Would you want to go through with this agreement right now? Or do, would you want to just uh, ask them first? Well, I'm, I'm pretty aware of the crew's abilities, and I think that what we're looking for here is to have laborers show up for projects that the crew couldn't handle because uh, the crew needs a supervisor there. And they, we normally just need one to four people, depending on the project. Sometimes routine work they're assisting with painting the signs and, and repairing things around the plaza and the parks and uh, landscaping and so on. And, and that isn't the kind of work the crew could uh, provide on, on a small scale like that. Okay. But I, I do think that we can, pr we can utilize them for other projects and we'll make sure we do that. Uh, it would be nice because like painting the signs and stuff like that, I don't know if it would be more cost effective to pay the supervisor and their, their possible workers um, if that would actually be less than the 150 and if we could actually provide more work towards them I mean I thought it would just be an interesting thing because I grew up in the landscaping and doing those little 
types of work and it really showed me a lot mm-hmm. of just about work ethic and discipline and i think that we could definitely spend that money here locally with somebody that are willing and and it's it fits their range so yeah. that was my only um question and to mention two things there too is uh we have hired local laborers through this firm it's really just a firm that pays for the uh takes care of the checks and and the overhead the social security and insurances so we've hired local workers and uh, we can continue to do so and generally they come from outside of the Ojai Valley but we're always looking for people within the Ojai Valley and then it really is up to 150,000 we have no intention to spend that much but that would be the high end so we're looking to contract out as mentioned in the letter uh, whatever services we can on a regular basis preferably to local firms but we, we need to request proposals for that okay thank you And while we have you there, I spoke with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Smith today, and she expressed a uh, a concern that with this labor contract that would leave, that would be 28% of our workforce under contract. And she had concerns about that, in that um, a permanent employee perhaps is um, a more loyal employee, and you get the idea. I didn't do this exactly correctly. We pulled it and then we went right to discussion. So since we're in the middle of discussion, let's just finish that. Uh, I just had one question in our packet. We got a copy of the agreement, but the agreement references in Exhibit A, which is the contractor's proposal, and we don't have that. I believe I saw it in there, but maybe it's at the beginning instead of the end. Is that what it was? I didn't see it. Oh. oh, okay. This is their proposal? Yeah, front and back. It's relatively simple. It's really a markup on what the take-home pay is for the laborer. Any other questions on item 1J? Is there a need to pull this from the consent and, and have a separate roll call? If not, then let's just include it in the consent calendar. So I'll entertain a motion. Motion, motion to uh, approve the consent calendar. Second. Roll call. Blatz. Yes. Clap. Yes. Lara. Yes. Strobel. Yes. Okay. We have no public hearings. Our next item is a discussion item, and it's the 2013 annual audited financial statements for the simple audit for the city of Ojai. Mr. There's a card. There's a card. For oh, I apologize. And I had that card right in my hand, and we voted, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Bill Murphy, and you wanted to speak about 1J. Thank you very much. I apologize for, uh, for that. That's okay. Um, you know, we talked a, quite a bit about it. Um, my name is Bill Murphy. I live at 1124 Golden West Avenue. Uh, I represent the crew. I am actually the new executive director of the crew. Uh, I've been on board now for a little over a month, and I wanted to talk just specifically about the temporary labor services agreement. I'm sorry, Mr. Grant, I wasn't able to get a hold of you today. I tried to call a couple times, I think once during lunch hour. So uh, my apologies for not talking to you prior to, uh, to coming up here. Um, I just want to, you know, restate here, um, I appreciate your comments about uh, hiring locally. Uh, the crew, as you well know, is a nonprofit organization that is local. Uh, it employs underprivileged kids from age 14 to 24. Uh, we do uh, trail maintenance. We do uh, habitat restoration. We do uh, riparian uh, replacement. Uh, we do fire and brush clearing. And this week, actually, we are up in Summerlin area and Carpinteria uh, doing some sort of landscape uh, type maintenance as a community event uh, for, the, for the people that live up there. Um, so you uh, are probably all well aware of the work that we do, uh, the quality of work we do. We did the uh, Libby uh, Bowl uh, Himalayan Blackberry removal. Uh, just finished that up last year. We've also done work on uh, the Ventura Avenue all the way down to uh, Willoughby Reserve and Foster Park and have a bunch of other projects going that way. Um, I just want to put a plug in for uh, the crew. Uh, as you said, for local employment, uh, this is part of our 
uh, uh, forte and our mission, uh, working and doing this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, as I read the as I read the staff report uh, for the proposal here, uh, I can assure you that I do not charge a 48 percent markup uh, on commission for my prices. Um, I think we do a great job uh, for the price that we give it, and uh, I would uh, appreciate uh, any consideration we have for this for this route. So, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So, I'd, so I'd, yes. I would suggest that, that Mr. Grant get together with Mr. Murphy yeah. and talk through the issue. And I, I think there are, we did talk today about this a little bit, uh, Mr. Grant and I, that is. And, and I think that there are some possibilities for using crews. So we'll investigate those. And the action tonight would not preclude that. Okay. And Mr. Fletcher, is there anything I need to do to correct the procedural error I just made? No, ma'am. Nothing you need to do. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. All right, our next, now our next item is the, uh, the audit for the, the annual audit and the single audit for the city. So I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. Mears to introduce our auditor. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is an uh, item to receive, file a 20, 2013 audit, for audit report and a single audit report. And uh, today, uh, Mr. Uh, Libby, our auditor, is here to review with the auditor, I mean, for the council. And he was here last week, January 22nd, to go over in detail with uh, audit and finance committee uh, during their meeting. And here's Mr. Libby. Ms. Mayors, I just have one question. Was our public member able to participate in the in the committee? No. He he what he wasn't able to do that because of his father was ill and okay. the hospital. All right, thank you. Hi everybody. Hi council. Hi Ms. Mayor. Uh, you should have copies of the audit reports, the regular audit, and the single audit report. Okay, um, had a nice meeting with the Finance Committee. A lot of questions were asked. A lot of answers were given. Okay, um, page one of the audit report, I'll make it pretty brief. We went through it in Finance Committee. It is the auditor's opinion. It's what they call an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion meaning the financial information in here is very accurate. Uh, we looked at internal controls for the city during the audit. Uh, last year we had a low internal control problem with OHI days. We looked at it again. Things were fixed. We're very happy now. Okay, no other findings or internal controls that are, they are in place and they are being followed. Um, one thing I'd like to say is about the general fund, you know, the heart of the city. If you go to page 18 of the audit, you will see the ending general fund balance is $8,458,325, which is uh, healthy for a city of this size. Uh, you look at it and it's over, if you go to page 22, you'll see your spending for the year was 7,256,327, meaning your fund balance is over 100% of your expenditures in the general fund, which is a healthy position to be in. I always tell people, I'm happy to see 10%, 15% is good, 100% is very good. You're doing a very good job, especially in the economy the last few years, be it property tax down, sales tax down, TOT down, and other parts of the state. It's very impressive to see you're in control of the city. And I tell you, I look at the budget pages of your audit report, and if you look at the general fund on page 57 and 58, 
you will see you're fairly close with budgeted items with the line items which tells me that your staff is giving you very good information during the year there's budget adjustments being done they're they're on top of it it's you know a lot of times if I see things way out of budget it means staff is behind I can tell you your staff is current just by looking at this okay your cash you know I talked a little bit about this last year it's it's on page 40 and 41 I'm jumping around I know but uh, 4041 where your staff where your cash is invested and I always tell cities this is not your money you're investing but but the citizens money you have to be careful with it you can't take risks with it you try to do the best you can with very low risk and you can see most of your money is in money market funds and the state pool you know it's the best place to be right now I mean I don't want you you know even though the stock market looks very good okay it's not your money it's the citizens money you have to you say the, the citizens money you have to protect it okay you can't risk it uh, the market last month has not been that well <laughs> but anyway it's very safe investments you're earning the best you can I know banks are paying very low interest but it's better than losing okay so it's nice to see uh, any questions on the city audit okay but we do we test transactions that happen during the year we look for compliance issues if it's a grant expenditure uh, we look to see if it's proper okay if something doesn't look right we're gonna tell you okay but you know it's we look to see that everything is signed off department heads are signing off finance signs off a city manager if he has to sign off all council that any check that's written council has uh, knowledge of okay we make sure checks and balances are being done for you okay the single audit which is a smaller audit this is for federal awards and you get a single audit when you're expenditures of federal awards is over five hundred thousand dollars in your case on the small audit on page three this is your expenditures of federal awards it was a little over a million dollars during the year most of it was FTA money for uh, the trolley service I think you got a couple new trolleys or um, and you extended the trolley route I think the service so anyway we look to see that that federal money was spent correctly that you followed the grant and again no findings on that you did it staff knows what's going on they did a good job okay any questions on anything good I just have a comment and sure. that is um, we worked our finance director and uh, our consultant pretty hard last I've forgotten when the meeting was whenever the meeting was and we were we went over these for about I'd say almost three hours yes and so um, I two of the issues that I addressed and perhaps Mr. Clark may want to mention or comment. And one was the was a twenty thousand um, dollar amount from the parks acquisition fund. And the second thing was trying to gain uh, more clarity on the impact of unfunded liabilities and our what financial state. So, did you want me to address those two items? Yes, please. Yeah, the, um, there was a misunderstanding about the source of funds um, 
for our, our recreation improvements in fiscal year 12 13 and we had charged some of those to the 20,000 park tax and when that was um, brought forward to the uh, recreation commission by the mayor we learned that that was a mistake and so we've uh, made a transfer this year to um, replenish that fund from the capital improvement fund and then <coughs> on our um, retirement liabilities particularly retirement um, health insurance we have um, a very high liability and a growing liability because currently the people who are retiring are people who are in the system when we had a richer benefit program but over the past couple years the city council has taken action to reduce substantially to a very minimum amount the retiree medical benefit and so as those people begin to mature and retire then and others fall off the program you'll begin to see that liability go down. But because of the size of the uh, issue, we're, we're on a pay-as-you-go basis right now. And I don't know if, did, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, most cities that I know of are, they do approach it the same way as pay-as-you-go. Some of them do try to designate a little bit of general fund balance, possibly to put it aside for the future to pay this expense as it comes due, but most do do pay as you go. Some, very few have set up a trust fund. If you put the money in the trust fund, you can't get it back. It's stuck there. So cities are aware of it. It's in the audit report. Uh, and basically, as long as you're aware of it and you, you know, you can plan for it, and I think you have a good sense for it that, yes, they, expenditures are going to be high for a while and then they will drop off i think you'll be fine but it's very very common to see this liability yours isn't that high it seems high i know it's a million dollars it seems high but i have some that will really scare you this isn't so bad council member have any questions no, I, I just have a comment. I, I wasn't able to attend that Wednesday meeting, even though I'm in the audit. So I apologize. I attended last year, which was really informative. But I did have a session with uh, our finance director, Ms. Mears. And I, I really ap appreciate she highlighted everything you guys spoke about and every major fund we have, um, our money that we're saving that you just noticed. So, so I appreciate uh, your objectivity when it comes to auditing our city because I think it's important as council members to know that we're uh, our staff is doing the right the right job so thank you just thank you I had an opportunity last year when I was mayor to to be on the uh, the finance committee and I appreciated the work that you and your firm did last year and I appreciate it again this year well, thank you we enjoy coming here. <laughs> quite the show tonight. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was for me at first, and I was like very excited. <laughs> and then I was glad it wasn't for me, I think. <laughs> okay. okay, I think that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, our next discussion item is the lighting ordinance implementation, and this is the one Ms. Topping wanted to speak on. But let's hear from staff, and, and uh, then I'll ask you to speak. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. The, the City Council adopted our dark sky exterior lighting ordinance um, back in August of last year. And most of that uh, ordinance has to do with new lights that are installed as new construction occurs over time. But there are some operating requirements for existing lights in the community. And one of the things we are tasked to do over the course of the year is to develop a public communications plan to educate the community as to what the requirements are with the thought that we will seek voluntarily compliance over the course of this year and then at the end of the year next august or september we'll review the ordinance and make sure we um, have it the way we want it in the long run and then after that we could decide to have a more rigorous enforcement requirement if that's your desire um, we put together a committee 
um, that includes Ms. Topping and also Deborah Pendry from the uh, uh, Green Coalition and at the time Ann McLaughlin who was our interim community development director and we've been working um, the four of us together on a communications program and we started with the uh, residential um, lighting and essentially the requirement with residential lighting is it needs to be fully shielded and downward directed or it needs to be turned off at 10 o'clock and there's several other caveats and so we uh, mailed postcards to all homes within the uh, city we placed ads in the paper we placed an insert in the paper and uh, had some articles written in the paper um, separate from our advertising and all of that was our effort to to put out the word and inform people as to what the requirements are and one of the things that the uh, green coalition is planning on doing is uh, surveying some random streets within the city's residential areas to see how well we're doing, how well we've done in terms of getting the word out and what the level of compliance is. With um, commercial lighting, the um, general requirement is that the lights um, either comply with the law or they be turned off, in other words, that they be fully shielded and downward directed, or that they be turned off after business hours. But there's an exception for that, which is that lighting that is essential for safety or security may be left on. But there really isn't any um, industry standard as to how to determine whether something um, is needed for safety or security purposes. So it becomes a very subjective situation. And so we talked quite a bit in this group about how to approach that. And the idea that we came up with is to define a standard of lighting that's fairly low. And to give you an example, it would be similar to the lighting that we have in the arcade um, along Ojai Avenue. And to say basically that if your lighting is no brighter than that, then we'll let you decide whether it's needed for safety or security. So it's a little bit than us deciding that. But if you believe you need brighter lighting than that, then you'll need to make a case to the community de development director um, as to why that is. And so the so um, people who, who feel that they um, need that have an out and have a way of making a presentation. And in fact, in our own lighting in the city, we have determined that we need slightly brighter lighting in the arcade plaza behind. And that's because of some of the issues that we've had with people camping out there and, and vandalizing and so forth. So I think we would be reasonable with others as we have been with ourselves when there's a legitimate safety or, or security um, need. So we, we have put together a resolution and it lays out um, this standard. Um, and there's several parts to it, which I won't go into in detail unless you have a question. Now one, one thing that came up, and I, and I thought it was a very good um, comment, is we really have not put this proposed standard out to the commercial and retail community for their input. And so rather than adopting the resolution tonight, you may want to direct us to um, circulate it within that community and get their comments and make sure that we're not missing something or unaware of something that, uh, that we should have taken into consideration. But I do think it's a very uh, solid starting point for that discussion. So that's uh, commercial. Then it, with uh, street lights, um, most of the street lights that we have are the um, what you would call uh, drop glass luminaires. In other words, the glass of the light hangs down below the shield that's around the top. And there is a program that the Edison Company has that allows you to set a standard um, that's different than what you already have. So normally when they have a, to replace a luminaire for um, maintenance purposes because it burned out or broken or, or something like that, their policy is to replace like with like. But if you adopt a different standard, they'll replace with that different standard. And so we're um, proposing a flat glass full cutoff standard, which would mean that the light would not extend below the shield and therefore would be um, fully shielded and downward directed. And so there's a resolution uh, for that purpose and we would recommend that you go ahead and adopt that tonight to set that standard. Um, there's a whole nother issue with street lighting 
um, it's partly financial and it's partly dark sky, and that is that we're spending more than we're um, bringing in with our lighting assessment district. And so over the years, um, because we have not been able to get the uh, property owners to agree to an increase in the assessment, we've developed a fairly substantial um, fund, negative fund balance in that particular fund of about 250000 and so we're looking at a couple alternatives to reduce the amount of money we spend on electricity. One is to turn the street lights off at midnight, which some communities have done. And although th that doesn't cut your um, total bill in half, it cuts the electric part of your bill in half. So we think it would save something like 15% of our um, electric bill. And the other thing is to look at the possibility of just eliminating some of the street lights in areas that we feel are overlit based on a dark sky standard. So our intention is to, to take a look at these two options and to bring them forward for discussion as we bring forward the assessment district on future agendas. So um, I, I think that's uh, about it, unless you have any questions. I have one question. Um, I think I'm in the right item, but I'm not certain. It's one of those, I read that somewhere. Um, and when I spoke with Mayor Pro Tem Smith, she had the same concern, and it was regarding flashing neon lights. Is that in a part of, there was, there's a list of, um, I'm not sure what to call them, a, a list that we're checking for oh. non-essential, it may have been in that list. I bet it was. But my question, well, both our question actually is, I believe flashing neon lights are banned in the uh -huh. city. So is the fact um, that they are being used simply because we're short of staff or because we haven't received a, a complaint? I, I would think so. So, you know, the, the what we're doing right now is a little bit different. You know, we're trying to get input on a standard for um, safety and security. But if there are flashing light issues that come to our attention, we can address them through code enforcement. Okay. And because they're banned here in Ojai, it wouldn't be a matter of turning them off at 10 o'clock. Right. If the, any lighting that's, that's not permitted, we'd, just, we'd require them to eliminate it or bring it up to standard, whatever. Council have any questions to staff? Yeah. Gail Topping. <laughs> what a night, huh? <laughs> um, I'm Gail Topping, 1417 Foothill Road. Um, City Manager Clark, Miss McLaughlin, Deborah Pentry, and myself have met several times, as was indicated. And tonight I'm representing the Ojai Green Coalition in her place. Um, these meetings really refined some of the problems that we saw and, and brought up some solutions as you're going to see uh, consider tonight. I know that the light ordinance um, uh, is viable. It's going to save oh, high money, it's going to save energy, and it's going to save and help the environment. We know that. It's also going to bring us up into the 21st century. When I was working on this committee, I did an informal uh, residential street light survey and found out that streets that were built before, or, uh, before 1960 had about uh, 10 homes on them, small lots with one street light on the block. That's before 1960. After 1960, 15 homes on the block had seven street lights. So it was one for every two small lots. Now, that's excessive lighting. That's what we're really dealing with in terms of the street lighting. It's a condition of excessive lighting. It came out of uh, the GE generation, remember that one? So that was then, this is now. We have a better understanding of light intensity 
and what 1600 lumens means to safety and lighting use. We understand that now going into the 21st century. So from all that Mr. Clark has strategized, we are going to save 15% possibly of the city's money on electricity. You can't turn your back on that by turning off some of the street lights. Also by um, flat um, in installations. I support this proposal, so does the Ojai Green Coalition. And I encourage you to do the same. I want to thank the staff, kind of praise Caesar at this point, um, for getting Ojai into this phase of educational um, uh, uh, compliance. We need it in the community. And our staff, um, um, working with the staff, has been very helpful and very clean and very creative, and I've appreciated it. Thank you. And Mr. Clark, um, just so that we're clear, you recommended or gave, gave us the option of not adopting recommendation number one, which is a resolution, but instead to direct staff to circulate um, a letter or circulate the guidelines to businesses? Exactly. Okay. And then to, to adopt item two, which is the flat glass full cut off? <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> okay. Any questions? From staff, I mean from council, sorry. Yes, Madam Mayor, uh, thank you and I appreciate Ms. Topping and everybody that was in that committee for starting the guidelines for essential commercial uh, lighting. I was uh, just concerned and, and I'm glad that Mr. Clark addressed it with reaching out to the merchants in the retail. I think it's really vital for us to start working with our community and coming up with guidelines that everybody agrees so I agree that we do need to start somewhere and this is a very good start it it, it seems like you put in a lot of work to identify all the commercial places and I would also like us to work also with uh, Chief Kenny just so that we make sure that that he points out maybe it would be useful to keep some lights there it would be useful uh, to it would deter some type of crime from happening there. So I think it would be a great idea to have the, all the important agencies collaborate and uh, come up to an agreement rather than just the city uh, putting this guidelines and uh, us having a backlash. So I just want to uh, be careful and make sure that we invite our public and community. Thank you. Any other comments <laughs> from council? Madam Mayor, I'll take a stab at a motion. Uh, the first motion is that I'd like to uh, direct staff to uh, meet with the commercial members of our community to discuss the establishment of guidelines for essential commercial lighting. Do you need a motion on that or do we just Let's do it? these individually because they are two resolutions. Uh, do you need a motion on that or do we just direct staff? Council direction. Is that the direction that okay. our leagues would like to go? Okay, then my motion is going to be to adapt, adopt the resolution which establishes uh, the flat glass full cutoff luminaries as a standard for street lights, for street light luminary replacements, and to direct the, the uh, city manager to develop options for balancing the street lighting fund, including the possibility of turning street lights off between midnight and dawn or any other hours that it's dark that uh, would seem appropriate. I'll second. Roll call. Blatz? Yes. Clapp? Yes. Lara? Yes. Strobel? Yes. Okay, we'll adjourn as the, am I at the right place before I adjourn us here? Okay. Yes, we'll adjourn as the uh, city council and convene as the 
successor redevelopment agency. I probably got it close to right. <laughs> And we have a consent calendar. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, I'll move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Roll call. Latz? Yes. Clapp? Yes. Lara? Yes. Straubel? Yes. And the discussion items are also under the Redevelopment Successor Agency. Okay, so the first discussion item is the su Successor Agency Fiscal Year 14-15 Budget. So to make it simple, the, um, the budget projection <coughs> as far as ex administrative expenditures go is $257,000, and the maximum amount we can claim for, um, under the state law is $250,000, which is a slight, slightly less. Um, and uh, we do show receiving the first installment of our city loan payment, which we think, in fact, is likely to be paid this time. <laughs> Um, and that would be for next fiscal year. Any questions of staff? We have a resolution. I'll entertain a motion. Okay. I uh, recommend to adopt resolution number RDA, RDSA 14 01. 01, approving the successor agency budget for the period. July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2015. Second. Roll call. Blatz? Yes. Clapp? Yes. Laura? Yes. Strobel? Yes. The next item is the, um, the recognized obligation payment schedule, ropes 1415A. And before we begin discussion, I talked with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Smith quite a bit today, this afternoon, and she wanted to um, to give you a very special thank you for serving on the ropes committee and all the work you did and and the efforts you made and made it clearer for everyone involved. So thank you, thank you. on behalf of Mayor Pro Tem Smith and the rest of the council. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you. So. Um, First of all, I'd like to point out that after the agenda was posted, our special counsel suggested some changes and revisions, and we've provided those under separate cover, so you should have those, and so the action reflects those pages. Um, secondly, w um, the amounts that we're seeking reimbursement for during this next six-month period are 125000 which is half of our administrative allowance. 353,000, which is a loan payment under the city loan reimbursement, and 26,000, which is the lease of the uh, park and ride and skateboard park area. And that's all we're entitled to ask for. <laughs> Does council have questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Clark, what are, the, uh, what are the chances that we're actually gonna get paid for this part of the ROPS? I think they're pretty good. Um, I, the, the big issue, so the, the, the state did not make a loan payment during the current fiscal year. And the reason that they gave, and this is a statewide policy, it didn't have anything to do with us, is that the way the law is written, there was an ambiguity about knowing exactly how much money they had rather than estimating how much money they had. And so they said, we, even though we accept these loans, we um, are not going to make a payment until next fiscal year. So I think they'll make a payment. However, they have not reviewed our loan, and I think we're going to have a dispute over the interest rate. And so the way we calculate the interest, the loan's 5.2 million, and the way they calculate it, it's 2.2 million. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like AT&T and the <laughs> Any other comments, questions from council? Okay, we have a resolution. So entertain a motion. Madam Mayor, I'll move to adopt resolution number RDSA 14-02, approving the ROPS 14-15A for the period July 1st, 2014 through December 31st, 2014. Second. Roll call. Blatt? Yes. Clapp? Yes. Laura? Yes. Strobel? 
Yes. And we'll adjourn as the uh, Redevelopment Successor Agency and reconvene as the City Council. And any reports from Council members? I've mentioned it, but I'll mention it again. It was a very, uh, very good meeting. Uh, the budget meeting was very informative. We, we asked a lot of questions, and it was a very good meeting. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, any um, oral, well, reports from city manager? You know, she left, but I, I should mention that, that Mrs. Topping really is a dynamo. She has done a lot of work she on has. this. <laughs> and, uh, and that was very Microphone. Helpful to us. A microphone. Uh, microphone. I was thanking uh, Mrs. Topping for all her hard work on behalf of the city and implementation of the lighting ordinance. She really did a great job. And I think it took how many years? She's been working on this for years, too. Long time. So a long time she was really stalwart. Mr. Fletcher? Nothing, thank you. Chief Kinney? Well, did you get a chance to see the crime stats in the um, city manager's report? Mm -hmm. We're pretty proud of those. Crime rates down um, for the city. If you look at the last two years, we're down 44% in part one crime, and for part uh, two crime, we're down 57%, so that's a good thing. And then I also gave Rhonda some photos to let you guys take a peek at and how to do with the um, complaint back there in the arcade and what we've done to bring it up, and we did some painting back there, and you can see some uh, before and after photos, so. Thank you. Madam Mayor, could I just uh, make a comment? I'm sorry, I just was reminded by Chief Kenny. I did re I did attend the annual uh, police uh, debriefing and, and sheriff debriefing, and it just was really encouraging the amount of work they're doing. And I just like to applaud them because not only did they tell us what they were doing successfully, but also pointed out the flaws that they're that know that's around the department that and they're fixing it so I just was wanting to give kudos to the sheriff's department for that thank you thank you and I was going to mention that sergeant I attend I was the council liaison for the parks and rec commission meeting last week and sergeant Arthur presented a report and it was um, very inclusive very informative and very well received thank you great thank you Ms. Mears Mr. Grant. Good evening, just a quickie. Uh, I, the crew has been hard at work at the Clef Vista Park for the past three or four weeks. So hopefully you noticed them up there. They've been weeding and clearing a lot of the vegetation to help work with the police. Uh, for we, They've had a little bit of problems with vagrants in the heavier brush over there, so we've decided to clear it down quite a bit. So one of the opportunities I had was to take a pause up there. We're normally working, but I understand why they call it the Clef Vista park the vista part of it now it's a beautiful view looking down uh ohio avenue down over the city with the with the topa mountains in the background so they did a nice job cleaning up there and uh the ohio valley land conservancy worked with us they did a lot of the uh, native planning up there and helped weed as well so it's kind of a cooperative effort and uh secondly hopefully you noticed that the uh the, the parking lot over at the rainbow bridge the matilla house signal parking lot was just rehabilitated so that was a third parking lot around the plaza area which is completed which we budgeted for this fiscal year and lastly uh libby the libby fountain has just been fenced off and you'll see that area we're starting to rehabilitate the fountain as well so we're removing all that hardness build up and fixing all the lights that are inside the fountain and next week they'll demolish all the exterior and rebuild that and uh, RTK is the local uh, quite an artist on the tile work and, and Richard and Mary have donated that tile which will go around the exterior so you should see that all fit, wrapping up next couple weeks okay. yeah that's fabulous anyone else mayor oh, I apologize madam city clerk I actually have two items this evening. Uh, I want to announce that Jolene Lloyd just turned in a resignation for the HPC. I hadn't had a chance to notify the city council. Mm -hmm. She turned that in today. So we do have an opening on the Historic Preservation Commission. We have an opening on the Arts Commission. And we have two openings on the Planning Commission. And we are holding interviews this Thursday starting at 2 p.m. 
for some of the applications I've been receiving more so I'll set those interviews up later and I've received a couple of applications for the arts uh, commission so and I advertised last Friday and I'll be in this Friday's newspaper as well so anyone out there or the newspaper can plug uh, people to turn in their applications I'd appreciate it and then also the Area Housing Authority notified me we will be getting applications for public housing, which is the Whispering Oaks and Loft Apartments. They're starting a waiting list, and those applications will be available February 3rd. And we can't not give them out till February 3rd. People are coming in and asking, but I've been asked by Area Housing not to give them out till February 3rd. Thank you. If there's nothing further, Meeting adjourned.